So welcome everyone. This is, I believe it's either episode four or five of The Approach. This is the uh, play, time and place where at St. Christopher's we have usually a guest who comes and talks to us about the scriptures coming up for the coming week. If you're joining us online on our YouTube channel, be sure to subscribe to that and click the little bell icon so you'll be notified every time you get a, every time we have something new for you to see. Also, if you are uh, being blessed by this, uh, we encourage you to support the ministry of St. Christopher's by using one of the links in the description of this video and so you can uh, support our ministry here. Uh, today we have with us, uh, the special guest star is the Right Reverend Dr. George Sumner, 7th of Dallas. And so we're very glad to have you here, Bishop. Good to be here. Outstanding. Good, be here. Good morning. I'm going to start with the collect. And um, let me just add a little editorial word that I have been using this collect throughout the last year, oh. COVID time. The, uh, the idea of our sense of being powerless ourselves and depending upon the agency of uh, Jesus Christ is, um, has been evocative for me in this last year. So, so Lent 3 is an uh, important one for me. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Almighty God, we, who see us that we have no power of ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls that we may be defended from all adversity that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Um, Outstanding. Let me, uh, so let me uh, pull up here. So we're yeah, talking good. About, go ahead. Yeah, you please go, go, yeah, go, go ahead and, um, yeah. Let me see here. I have... Now messed this up, so I had the third Sunday in Lent because I was uh, fourth Sunday in Lent because I'm sitting. I have a guest preacher next week, so I'm sending him the lessons. Uh, but we're gonna we are dealing with uh, year three, I think. So let's take a look here. Yes, the third yeah. Sunday in Lent, rather. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, can I can I get a volunteer to read for me or what? Sure. I'll tell you what right. our practice has been to uh, to. Uh, Take a look at the uh, Old Testament reading because that's what we're doing. Right. We talk about that for a while. I keep an eye on the time so we have time to talk about the gospel. So, Good. yes. We'll, uh, can we Good. get a Yes. We Good. Usually have Let me, um, I'm, I'm going to start with, um, I'm going to start with two stories before we start, and that'll get us, set us up for the Old Testament lesson. So, when I was a rector, I had a very involved new Christian who was very excited about, he was doing morning and evening prayer every day in the lectionary. And after a year, he said to me, finally, this morning, I got all the lesson, the Sunday lessons, the lections for Sunday morning to line up thematically. I saw how they all lined up and I didn't have the heart to tell him that in the lectionary, the Old Testament is attuned to the gospel and we were simply reading the epistle sequentially through that they didn't in fact line up except that of course it's all about christ ultimately so i guess it all does line up but anyway sometimes they do actually line up so i'm going to try to see if they do this this uh, for these particular lections but let me tell you the story i want to tell you so the story i want to tell you is from the late 16th century in China. It's a missionary story. And it, it goes like this, that the, um, the missionaries arrived and the first missionaries there were Jesuits. These are Roman Catholic missionaries. And for those who are outside the Roman Catholic world, they think oh, those Roman Catholics all agree about everything, but actually it's not that simple. They have their own debates. So the Jesuits came and as missionaries, they always wanted to adapt themselves to the place they got. And the Jesuit missionaries wanted to say, what's the common ground that a Mandarin 16th, 17th century uh, Chinese man or woman would understand to build on that and then to move toward 
the whole gospel. Um, and they sometimes th they thought that might take a period of time, but often they're building on the doctrine of creation, the creator of all. That is something that a 16th century Mandarin would understand. But the cross of Christ, pretty strange new teaching. Um, and they, they worked on that for a number for several years. And then the Dominicans arrived. And the Dominicans believed that you couldn't separate out the understandable parts from the other parts of the Christian faith, which you could get to later. The whole thing was a package deal. And that the cross of Christ wasn't something you'd get to in year three or five, but that it was something you had to take in from the beginning. So the first Dominican missionaries had, a, they had a great crucifix and they would march through the steep streets of Beijing saying repent and with the, with the cross of Christ. And this was both impressive and greatly, con, you know, a thing of great consternation to the, to the Chinese hearers. My point being that in the Bible, the, the story of the Bible has a couple of strains or what would you say, kind of uh, uh, ligaments, whatever, uh, arteries that run through the whole thing. And one is the artery of the doctrine of creation, right? That though we be confused and broken creatures, we are still God's creatures, right? And it has another artery, which is the doctrine of redemption. That in the, you know, if you read the beginning of Genesis, we hear about the creation of the world, creation of the human, the human fall. Humans continue to just muck the thing up even worse as you get on in Genesis until finally he calls Abraham and this, this idea of a calling a people and eventually saving that people and giving them this hope, uh, you know, comes into the Bible. So there's a there's an artery of the creation, and there's an artery which is redemption. God using a particular people, God's means of salvation. Right. So here's my question. Before I get to I am I am I am getting to Exodus, Exodus 20. Don't worry. I'm, this is the long wind up. This is Satchel Page with the windup. We're going to release the pitch any minute now. Um, so what I want to ask you is, if you think about the big story of the Bible, creation to the 21st chapter of Revelation, how do those two themes work out? Like, what? how do those two arteries intertwine, whatever the metaphor is, you know what I mean? Like when you get to the last chapter of the Bible, which artery is that? When the Bible ends, what do you, what do you, what do you, what do you, what would you say about that? Everybody know, like in the end, they're all gathered, they're in Jerusalem, they're all singing, uh, you know, no more tears. Uh, the whole world is a temple. Great picture. What what about that? Is that like creation, redemption? Tell me about that picture at the end. Last chapter of the story. One of the things that we've been talking about as we've gone through some of these readings over the last few weeks is how it's very it, it's harder to understand in that linear stretch, right? From Genesis to Revelation, but if you right. look at the resurrection as right. the center of a circle, yes. right, all Correct. of those, all of those points, right, yeah, 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 good, go that's center. great, that's right. So look about, okay, so let's review um, what Father just said. In the resurrection, tell me how there is redemption and creation. Lent is moving toward Easter. In the resurrection story, is that a creation story? Or is that a redemption story? Or are my, are my categories wacky? 
I think you're straddling categories. Yeah, right. Tell me how I'm strategy straddling the categories. Well, it's it, it, it's remaking creation. Correct. Right. So this yeah. isn't just a, it's not a re, Jesus raised from the dead with this strange thing called a, a spiritual body, right? And the promise of remaking the world, new heaven and new earth, that's a new creation, right? Yeah. And yet following him is to be a recipient of his saving work, right? Yeah. And it's a physical, it's a, it's a physical body too. I mean, right. He tells yeah. Thomas, you touch me. Right. It's like yes. a chapter before he says, don't touch me, but right. Um, but you know, yes. put, your, put your hand in my side, put your finger in the right. nail marks, right? It's a body, right? It is a body. And, and you know, the, the, the Christian life, the sacraments um, are a sign of um, this, this at once, you know, um, material and spiritual salvation. And the kingdom of God is going to be a new city, right? It's not just a kind of wavelength somehow, but it's going to be a recreation of the world, which is also redeemed, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm saying is these two arteries are running through, but I mean, the metaphor is breaking down. I'm not working. Anyway, these two themes are working through, but they're all, but they're actually, they're actually in contact. And, and, and you see that in the resurrection, right? Mm -hmm. So Isaiah, the prophet says, and the Lord says in Isaiah, there's going to be a new creation, right? Um, and that gets picked up obviously in the new Testament. Okay. So, so what I want you to, what I want to think about in the 10 commandments we're going to run this whole creation redemption thing are they two yes are they two separately no they're connected there's one god of heaven and earth god's actions are one i mean he, he they're, they're all of, of one type because they're all his and he's redemption is a new creation and creation is a redemption of the world out of nothingness and chaos, right? Okay, I'm going to try to pull that out of this. Somebody read Exodus 20. I vote for George Wheeler to read that. Go ahead. Did, are you volunteering, Nancy? Nancy, what? you read Exodus 20, 21 to 17 for us. I, I'll do that for you. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents, to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your town. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Thank you. So uh, the Ten Commandments... Um, obviously, uh, very, um, very important in the whole in the in the catechism of the church, right? I mean, when they in the, traditionally the catechism was um, included the Lord's Prayer and the uh, Creed and the Ten Commandments. But I want to ask. Here's the question I want to ask first: 
The passage we are reading doesn't actually begin with the Ten Commandments, but it begins with the speaker of the Ten Commandments introducing himself. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, right? And that's Exodus 20. That's what's just happened, right? We, this is in the context of the oppression of the people of children of Israel, their, uh, the plagues, they're crossing the Red Sea, and now at Sinai, they're given the, 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 the law, right? Yeah, Moses up on the mountain. So why does he begin like that? What's that? I mean, he, he, then he gets down to business. Here are 10 things you're to do and not to do, right? Um, well, it seems he has to establish his credibility. And, right? Um, yes. And this sounds weird, but uh, make sure everybody understands the place he holds and appreciates right. that. I'm not wording that properly, but no, anyway. that's good. That's good. Like he's got to show that he's got, he has the authority, right? He's the yeah. one. To, he's the one to say this, right? <clears throat> and and why? And and so let, let's uh, let's drill down that a little bit more. So he has brought them out of Egypt, right? <laughs> He's redeemed them. This is like the, rede the redemption theme big time. Therefore, they are what? Chosen people. Redeemed. Chosen people, right. Yeah, they're, they're the chosen, right? They're his. They are <clears throat> his people uniquely, right? And like you all are mine. You are my chosen, chosen ones. And therefore, this is what it's going to look like, right? That this is now tell me obviously you know we 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 um it's easy to read these as a series of, of prohibitions right like you know um it's easy to read these as a series of um i i, I that image you know those things where you can put up for dogs so they don't run outside your yard the like invisible electric fence right like this yeah. is this is a 10 part Elizabeth, you know, just electric fence, right? For the dog. But tell me more about that. What, tell, give, me, give me a more positive take here. I what? prefer to think of them as boundaries. Okay, right. And boundaries are, and, and if they're boundaries, they're living inside the boundary, right? So there's a safety thing, like mm -hmm. these are 10 hot stoves you could put your hand on, bad idea, right? Um, these are 10 ways to keep the dog in the boundaries. Um, put more positively, what is that zone within the boundaries? Like these 10 so, rules define where they live. What is right. the land they live in? Yeah, well, I, just, I wanted to say, when, when you talk about boundaries, one of the, one of the things that I think of uh, when I think about that is, you know that bridge that crosses the Rio Grande that's like right outside of Taos? Um, where you, you go, to, it's it's a really long way down. It's kind of like the, the edge of the Grand Canyon, I think almost. Right. And, um, but you, I think about the boundaries on that bridge. If there weren't boundaries there, I would be flat on my face in the middle of it. You know, right. scared that I would fall off. But because there is a boundary there, I can walk up to it and see. Yes, you know, right. What, Right. And that's a big theme in Exodus. I mean, one of the huge themes is what's the thing in, uh, in um, uh, C.S. Lewis, in Narnia? He is not safe, but he's good, right? Like, he's not a tame is, lion. Yeah. This, we are approaching the God who is a, you know, infinite fire here, right? Like, you, he left the other, he left the folks down at the bottom of the hill because this was, he needed the, he needed the, uh, you know, uh, this, he was going to look at God, right? This is, um, mm -hmm. so these are like, it's not just, it's not just boundaries to keep you away from putting your hand on a stove, although there's definitely that too, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also, he, they've been called to approach God. And most people who approach God in the Old Testament this is, you know, I mean, this is, he's perfectly holy and, 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 and pure, right? So this is like, um, and we aren't. So 
So anyway, this is like how safely to live with God. Um, okay. So I, tell me more about this. Um, can I throw something out that is sort of a, a visual that, as you describe it as boundaries, it sounds very much like that, um, like a parent and the loving arms of a parent and the, the rules they set out. Correct. Uh, there's comfort within those loving arms of the parent and, you know, yes. God. Correct. So. Right. Anyway. That's a very important idea because, you know, when we get to Paul in our fallen minds, we think of law. I mean, law is law is the opposite of, of love and grace. Right. There's command, which is harsh. And then there's acceptance and invitation and love. Right. But that's because we're fallen. Whereas, in fact, um, you know, Paul says the law is true and holy and good. And, and what you're saying is, if you've been the parent of an adolescent, you know that the rules and your love for them are not opposites, right? That goes back to the, the loving person says, hand on stove, bad. Um, uh, right. So, right. This is, these are at once, at once strict and also an expression that the, the, the zone in which Israel is to live is actually the zone of the love of God, right? Relationship to God, not, not the, the, they're not living. I mean, I can say this because my ancestors are Puritans. Um, they're not just living some harsh puritanical thing, right? They're living with God, which is a loving and B he's, perfectly holy right so you gotta yeah. you know get ready for that there's a thing that's kind of a revolution go ahead, go ahead. Uh, so that's kind of a revolutionary thing too because you know we, we talked about this a little bit last week with the covenant with abraham it's one thing for us to know that there are gods or a god right and just to be kind of aware of that but for god to say i am going to be your god yes right is is, is a much different thing than what than what an Egyptian would say about right. Horus, yes. right? Right, right. And he goes, and he goes um, in the, you know, in the second commandment, th then he's saying, your instinct, because you're my creatures, but you're fallen creatures, your instinct is to, is to sort of put one together, right? That works for you, right? And there's, you know, that wonderful story in the Exodus where they, they're out in the, you know, they're waiting for Moses and, he doesn't show up and they get impatient and they decide to make themselves a, a god, right? And they throw all their rings in the in the you know the, the furnace and out comes the golden calf. And then when he when he Moses finally comes back, he says, What are you doing? And they say, Well, you know, we it it just kind of appeared, you know, like we threw stuff in and whoop, there it is. You know, it's like we didn't do it's, it's sort of like a three-year-old, but I don't know, my hand took the cookie. I didn't know, you know. Um so they're kind of made in their, they're made to make themselves gods, right? And so the story's complex that way. On the one hand, they're made by God for God, the, re, the true God, because we read Genesis, right? But now all of a sudden they think, I mean, you're right. This God who tells them who he is, right? I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the God who is going to redeem you. Uh, I am who I am, right? Chapter three of Exodus, he's, he didn't debate. With, it wasn't like a negotiation who he is. He appears to Moses and he tells him who he is, right? And who he is is not dependent on who they would like him to be or think he is. And then he calls them and there isn't a whole lot of negotiation in that either. But it is that for which they were made and not that for which they're called. Okay, so what... Tell me more about, okay, they're, they're to have no other gods, even their, you know, the human instinct is to make yourself a god, right? One that suits your, 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 your needs and your, uh, your whatever personality type. Yeah, do you mean, so, so it's, it's interesting you say that, you, you say make yourself a god. I heard it like turn yourself into a god. What you mean yeah, is right. make a god yes. for yourself. Correct. But I so think right. there's a both of them. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in Genesis 3, you know, the, the serpent, we, we had this reading and recently, and the, the serpent says, um, no, no, he, the only reason he told you you can't do that, that was, you know, the giving of the first commandment is, 
is back in, in, in the beginning of Genesis. And he said, no, 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 that's just because you will, but you will become like gods. You, he, he's afraid that you're going to realize your, your potentials. Right. Um, so they, and, and you're right that the, the making, the first God they make for themselves is themselves. Right. Mm-hmm. They, when, as soon as they hear, well, maybe we could be gods, they think, okay. Right. <laughs> so, right. The making, the making of themselves a God and the making themselves God are kind of connected. But of course, what they're actually making, and there's all this in the prophets about you make these dumb idols that can't talk and can't see their, their efforts at making themselves God actually make things God, which is, ends up being sort of pathetic. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So he's, he's drawn that line that they belong to him and therefore that he is to be their God. He is a jealous God, right? This is a, unilateral but also i mean in a relationship of 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 love which is which is exclusive so why wh- where does he go from then the 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 uh, wrong use of the name right and the sabbath let's talk about those what it, what how does that follow the theme we're talking about hmm What's he so? Why is he? Why is he big on this? The use using of the name, and not and 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 leaving the Sabbath holy. That Sabbath holy one is really hard. I tell you, activist, over busy, whatever. Those of us ADD like 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 that's. I'm convinced that a lot of contemporary spirituality comes down to trying to hear that. Anyway, that's side issue. Why are those a big deal to, to the God of Israel? So not What's packed into those? Why can't why can't well, I start? I often think on the I, I'm not sure if I'm getting this, but on the name uh, use misusing the name of the Lord your God that uh, I think about you know what's happened over history that God is the most powerful thing. So everybody wants that power for yes, right. their cause. Well, God's on my side. God's going to help me win this football game, whatever right. it is. So yes. it's sort of like uh, it's about that power yes. that people are going to want. Right, exactly right. Yes. Knowing the name. Cause, yes. A powerful cause that's got God apparently right. on its side. Uh, and that's connected to knowing the name, right? You know, there are, there are traditional societies where you have a regular name and then you have a secret name that only certain people have. I mean, you know, names, knowing somebody's name is having a relationship and having some kind of, some kind of leverage on them. So he has revealed his name to them in chapter three, right? And mm-hmm. it's quite a name. It's a name that says something like, I mean, Martin Buber translated it, I will appear whenever I choose to appear. That. That's his name, like, which is to say, my name is the name of a God you cannot manipulate. I, I have chosen to give you my name, but packed into it is the, I'm not, I'm not your household God now, right? Yeah. So he said, don't try to think you can, um, you can uh, deploy my name. And, and you're right, human beings have deployed God for lots of purposes, Yes, right. I mean, you know, um, World War One was fought between two sides who were not only invoking the same God, they were invoking the same, mostly pure. I mean, uh, Protestant. You know, I mean, Western. I mean, anyway. So yes, he's he's saying the relationship begins with me, begins and ends with me. You're not to manipulate me. What about the Sabbath? Well, I just said it's something interesting on that. That is, you 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 cannot take control of who I say I am. Just like in the second commandment, you can't take control of what you think I look like, of what my image is right. either. Yeah, I, right. I I liked that connection yes. there when we yeah. made it. And there's something built in. I mean, it goes back to the idea of being in the image of God. So, so we are in in you know Genesis one made in God's image. 
And that involves various things like imagination, thought, language. Because of imagination, thought, and language, we can pray. We're made to pray to God, right? That's what we're for, mm -hmm. to love God, adore God. And to do that, we have to have things like imagination and, and, and words. But being who we are, we will turn imagination into our own imaginings and we will turn language into power, right? So mm -hmm. that's the kind of knife edge of in the image of God, right? That it's both our, it's this gift to us and also this, this risk. So along that same theme, what's the deal with the Sabbath? What is the institution that he made to keep it holy? And so the, the rest of the week, you are entirely too human and you're just thinking of yourself and what you have to do and bringing in the crops. Right. And so I deserve at least one day that you will be Yes. Right. That's right. That, that the rest, all the, all the labor you have to do is, is also given by God, but it's something you are doing by your own energies, right? agency and and you will be i mean and we're tempted to think we're in charge of that right mm -hmm. um all the time and pagan religion took a lot of interest in trying to promote that fertility trying to you know to um so that the sabbath is right this reminder that we have to rest and that and that that reminds us that our we, we don't our own efforts do not make ourselves what's the psalm 126 um uh, how's it go um uh unless the lord makes the house the one is um it is in vain in vain that you wake up early in vain that you you know um so it, it, it's you're not doing this stuff right um what else about the Sabbath? To remind, to, to compare Exodus 20, again, go back to our two themes, creation yeah. and redemption. This is a redemption passage mostly, yeah. but creation. I think of, yeah. Yeah. I think of, I think of what my, my, my temptation is to break that commandment, right? Uh, what, what am I trying to, it shouldn't seem like, I mean, I'm lazy enough as it is. I, I don't usually need encouragement not to work, right? Um, but I think about what my temptation is, and it's just, you know, if I just had one more day, I could really, right? Uh, I could nail this down. It's, it, it's almost like God is saying, I have created things. Yes. And there's nothing you are going to do to improve on that. So right. stop. Yes. I, 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 I'm, I'm very sympathetic to this notion that if I just finish all of this, I will have cleared the deck and then I'll be ready to rest with you, God. But, you know, it's like, um, that's, that's, there's a lot of willfulness in that. Well, you, and Father Chris, you talked about the, the circular nature uh, um, on this theme. And mm -hmm. to me, it, it's sort of like, we keep rolling back around to the Sabbath day. So it is, it's a cycle that uh, we recenter on Sabbath day. So it's, it is somewhat circular. Like right. Else yes. Day. That's very important. You know, the, the creation redemption theme is a pretty linear thing. The Bible goes from X, Genesis 1 to Revelation 21, right? Story. But there is running through it this theme of, I mean, God is, God is eternal, and we are invited to rest with him, right? So the idea of the rest this is a big thing in Hebrews, right? It's a big thing in Genesis 1. Like at the end of creation... We're supposed to have the Sabbath comes from creation. At the beginning of the creation of the world, we are already invited to rest with God. Mm -hmm. And in the end of the story, we're to rest with God. And Hebrews says the divine rest travels with us, right? So there's this kind of linear thing going, right? But there's also this other, this other thought that throughout it all, we're invited to rest with God. And it's very and Augustinian in a way. Right, right. Yeah. The, the, the city of God is both above us and ahead of us, right? Yeah. Uh, we're, and our we're, hearts are restless until they rest. Right. And we are, we are, um, uh, the rest is a gift to us. 
And that's connect. Okay, so help connect this to the idea of worship. It isn't just that we're, I should add that the Anglicans against those Puritans I mentioned earlier did think that rest on the Sabbath, the Christian Sabbath, let's call it Sunday for our sake, did include play, right? The Anglicans were all for sports on Sunday. They would have liked Dallas, right? Sunday <laughs> sports, good. Puritans, not good. Um, but anyway, mostly the Sabbath is for worship. So what does that tell you about worship? Genesis, worship. Exodus, Revelation, the whole thing. Worship is restful and reassuring. I don't know. <laughs> sure. right. In other words, the worship is, is a, the worship is under the category of rest, right? That's important because you think sometimes we think of it as useful. I hope it's useful. We learn things. We are in, we are sort of in, motivated to be better evangelists, better whatever, right? Like worship is worship. Um, uh, does something right but there's a side of it which is simply blessedly useless right that's a big augustinian theme right mm -hmm. uti and furor like there's use and there's enjoyment right he says things that in the creation are given to us to use but god cannot be used only enjoyed he says as soon as you use god you i mean praying can lower your blood pressure they say right Meditation, mm -hmm. that's good. Low blood pressure, good. But it's actually not what God is for. God is to be enjoyed because we're to rest in him, right? So um, so tell me more about that. Worship is rest. This is hard for clergy because Sunday morning does not always feel restful. <laughs> no. The, the, no. Clergy, the clergyman thinks, I speak for myself, that Sunday morning is work. This is a no, this is a challenge for the clergy, right? Because it isn't work. Why what is it why, in what way is it rest? So, you know, when well, you think about leisure, go, ahead, go I'm sorry, go ahead, Holly, please. No, I'm I I always think whatever I say is probably very random. You do it. You are doing you are you are you are batting 5 for 5, let me tell you. That uh well, there's so much comfort in, in what you hear. So in that way, it's restful because it's reassuring. But I also, where my random thoughts go is the music aspect of our worship, that that is very it's sort of uplifting and refreshing. Um, and maybe that is a, a moment of- Yes, right. For the clergy as well. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. No, I like this. So the part about music, means, I mean, I think what we connect here is worship and rest and the beautiful, right? In other words, you know, the beauty of holiness. So beautiful isn't something you do anything with, right? Like it doesn't, you know what I'm saying? It isn't utilitarian. So we enjoy God we, we, I mean, the, 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 the being in the image of God is the capacity to adore God. And that doesn't actually do anything. Do you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. it simply is a thing we enjoy. And the closest thing we can see, and this is why the beautiful is important for the religious life, right? That you behold something that's beautiful or you hear Bach. And that is, that is, that there's a kind of intimation in that of what we mean by, by worship, right? That's why that's all in there. Um, okay, now we're gonna get down to the, to, to the, you know, we're getting down to the, do this, uh, mostly don't do this actually. Pretty much all don't do this, except for this one do do this, right? Honor your, mm -hmm. okay. What about the, these ones sound like law, right? And law, yeah. has a, law has a bad rap for good reasons in the New Testament, right? Law is in contrast to gospel. Gospel, right? Works are contrasted with grace. Hey. Yeah, great. So tell me what, tell me about the rest of them, other than honor your mother and your father is always a favorite. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> well, did you ever see that Simpsons where where they you know they they backtrack and they do the Ten Commandments? I've always wondered about that because these it seems like this part of it is obvious, right? These are not things that need yes. to be revealed to you. But, right. you know, they're That's walking right. along. It's like, well, good morning, Omar the adulterer. You know, yes. <laughs> good morning, Homer the thief. You know? yes. And then right. Moses comes down and says, no more adultery, no more stealing. And, yes. and the inevitable, don't. Right, right, <laughs> well, right. And this this part, I, I don't remember the code of Hammurabi, but it's like probably pretty similar, right? Who Hammurabi knows? was a, was a, was a, full bore pagan. And he came up with some stuff like this, right? Don't murder, don't steal. So what, that's the, okay. So what's this doing in the 10 commandments? It's both, because everything we've been saying so far is unique relationship to the God of Israel. Redemption, full, full bore redemptive theme. You're my people. I set you apart with this, even though this is sort of what you were made as a human to do. Now we get down to law as law. You know, but it's weird to talk about too, because you know we've got this law in the middle of the five books of the law, right? Correct. And we're looking forward to uh -huh. the other six hundred and twelve yeah. commandments. Right. Yes, and these so, ones, so it's right. so vague sometimes. These ones are privileged, right? They whatever whatever somebody tells you first thing out of their mouth is always pretty interesting, right? It's going to go on for pages, but he, this is the opener, right? And therefore, these are important. And at some level, they do sound like you don't need to, you don't need to be an Israelite or a Christian, just be a human. Martin Luther, I should add, thought he had a, I mean, he wasn't, he had a whole natural theology argument, by which I mean, he thought the Ten Commandments were what the proper relation of a creature to the Creator is, and he thought he thought they were transcultural. He thought this was this this worked for every culture and every human being. Like this is where God tells you what the shape of just being a creature is, and then. You know, and then the other stuff that's going to come in Exodus and Leviticus and all, that's all like added on top. So, but now that's not quite right because we just said, spent a number of minutes saying the opposite of that, that this has everything to do with their unique relationship. Mm -hmm. But Luther thought the whole thing was pretty much, um, pretty much worked in Papua New Guinea, Peru, Dallas, you know, uh, Kaluit, you know, whatever. Um, so tell me about the rest of it. I'm gonna, I want to bring up a point that Good. I'm probably opening up a can of worms. That's, that's what we're here for. We're, I mean, that, that ship sailed, Karen. That's awesome. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. The one that the one that gets me is you shall not commit adultery. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm a divorced woman. Right. And we're in a pandemic, so this is an interesting one. Um, and I've had some, I heard an interesting comment one time about this uh, by a priest, and I'm not gonna repeat it. Um, but I am very, I'm a little bit more open-minded than some um, on this. Uh, it's, I don't know, I've heard a lot of things and I think it's okay to, to have sex outside of marriage. I mean, what, you know, what is it, a date, you know, in this, we're in 2021 and, right. uh, you know, this is very controversial, especially in some, you know, my, my um, cousin was a, fundamentalist Baptist. Um, right. Yeah. And I, I was christened and confirmed in the Episcopal Church. So, um, so this is pretty controversial. Now some, there was a priest that believed that you weren't supposed to have uh, something about comparing sex outside of marriage. Apparently it was like a, a talk comparing it to dogs. And I thought, 
that that was pretty um yeah an inappropriate right <laughs> comment well, I think, here. right yes <laughs> i think part of what um you know um i just had to say that right no it's it uh, I, and i think if you I didn't you, want to, but I had to. You could, you could bore down on or, 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 or meditate on each of these and find, let me give you an example. Thou shalt not commit murder. Well, there, there are textbooks on of ethics, right? What about, I don't know, somebody breaking into your home. What about war? What about, I mean, you go down the list, right? So you, so, Thou shalt not steal. Then you got your you got your lay miserable kind of thing, right? I mean, uh, babe, uh, do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Um, what about, um, you know? I mean, who was it Kant who said that if somebody's breaking in your house and they ask where where is your safe, you put to tell them like yeah. I mean, anyway, my point is each of these could open up a long discussion about cases and situations and degrees of fault and <laughs> content. You know what I'm saying? Like that, that, that's what ethics is. So I think yeah. honor, honor your father and your mother. Well, sometimes your father and your mother are just weren't helpful, right? And you, I mean, <laughs> right. a lot of people, therapy is about working out whatever your father and your mother told you, which was like, anyway. Um, so I think let's, let's take, let's take the fact that each one of these is a can out of which worms could come, right? That's mm -hmm. probably true, right? And you could do some kind of sit, you know, contextual question about people's relations. And, uh, so let's go to, let's go to the, the intent of the command, right? So what's the part of the command that is that you can hear? Like what, what's in the command that isn't sort of contextual or, or whatever um, that sounds harsh, but actually you can hear as gospel. That's what I'm trying to say, right? How can you hear all of these commands having to do with the God of Israel, like him? Right, because once you get to us, then human beings have all kinds of situations, context, motives, everything. I don't know what. But what does each command say about God? Leave us out of it because we're complicated, right? What does each well, command <laughs> say about God? Something, something gospel, right? That's a different question. Could you see those as the other side of the? mirror that on the flip side of the mirror uh i don't know if you would call it sin but on the flip side you focus on god so right yeah uh, yes he, right i think i think the flip side is each one each one is a prohibition each one says don't put your hand on these seven burning stoves right hot stoves mm -hmm. but you could also say each one is something positive right so thou shalt not murder. That could be a way of saying, you know what? I'm the creator, you're the creature. Life and death belongs to me, right? Mm -hmm. I'm God, I give life, right? And I take life and I, I am the Lord of heaven and earth. You are, it is not for you. In other words, he's saying, now, again, does that open up ethical problems? Do pacifists reach for that? Ver they do indeed, right? Uh, mm -hmm. St. Thomas Aquinas said that war fell under the category of defending widows and orphans, right? Okay, well, that's, that's a, he's a smart guy, good argument. Um, you see my point, though. Thou shalt not murder is either don't you do this or else, and it is that, but it's also because I am the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. That verse is going to run through the whole thing. That's what I'm saying. Every single sentence is about and thou shalt not commit adultery is saying something special about marriage, not about, do you see what I'm saying? It isn't, it is also a prohibition and human beings need prohibition because they're, they, you know, they, we, we, we dilute ourselves easily, but um, 
It's also saying there's something in marriage which is connected to the first verse. I am the God of the Lord your God. You see my point? In the beginning of this passage, he creates a covenant of exclusivity with them, right? So this isn't, this isn't first of all, about sex. Oh, it's definitely about sex. It's first of all about the fact that for you all, marriage will have some relation to, it'll be a reminder of exclusive covenantal relationships of which example 1A is me and you, God and Israel, right? So that's it's almost like he's it. setting up. It's almost like he's setting up, knowing what's going to happen with the prophets down the line. Because yeah, the right, theme, exactly. The constant right. theme is that Israel is committing adultery yes. with right. the other gods. This is going to run through Hosea, right? Hosea, you know, Jeremiah, everybody remember, yeah. Everybody yeah. remember like the Hosea so. story? God tells Hosea his wife was unfaithful, right? His wife wandered off, and God said to to Hosea, "What?" you go take her back and love her, right? And that was a, because he's a prophet, that, that's an image of God's redeeming Israel. So marriage is also marriage. It's marriage, it's a you know, human relationship. And heaven knows, if you read the Old Testament, marriage is one complicated thing in the Old Testament, let me tell you, right? We've been reading through Genesis. It is not a sort of standard, What I, I love, what is it? What is it, Tom? Uh, and Tom Wright says the Old Testament is great. It's full of, uh, you know, violence, uh, deception, adultery, and that's just the first six chapters. Anyway, um, I mean, marriage is like complicated in the Old Testament, but what isn't complicated is Israel, or maybe, or it's different, is Israel's relationship to the God of Israel, right? That's a marriage. Runs through Hosea, right? It's going to go on. There's going to be stuff in the Psalms, which sounds like that, right? The marriage feast. Um, and it's going to go all the way to Ephesians, right? Ephesians 5. This, what, is, what does Paul say about marriage? This is a mysterion, a mystery, which represents Christ in the church. That's straight out of Exodus 20, right? All right, let's do, okay. Thou shalt not steal. What's that got to do with Israel? What we're trying to do is find positive relations to the first sentence. I am your God and you are my people. Nobody should steal. If you're a full, you know, you know, straightforward pagan, you still shouldn't steal people's stuff. But why is this especially true for them? Don't steal what belongs to God. Right. I mean, stealing, stealing violates your relation to God, partly because you are in relation to your fellow Israelite, right? That person is now your clan, religion, holy clan, your, your, your covenant brother or sister, right? That's why in the, in the New Testament, you know, in the first Corinthians, you can't go to a law court. You all are covenant brothers and sisters. you got to work it out, Right. It is, it's, an, it's, a, it's a scandal that you have to go to pagans and work this stuff out because these people are your, you have to forgive them 70 times seven. You got to forgive your fellow Christian 490 times, right? When I, first, when I first started as bishop, they brought me a conflict within a parish that will remain unnamed. And they said, we went, we tried to talk to them three times. They still don't, I say, you got 487 to go. Come back to me, and we will we will really come down on them, right? I mean, these are your covenant brothers and sisters, right? Um, and what's the last one? You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, right? Mm -hmm. The um, because because the you know Israel is to bear witness to God. You have to you're so all right. Um, let me um. I was going to say, we're coming up on our hour. We've got a few. We hours are. Left. We're coming up on our hour. So that means we're going to have to do the gospel in three minutes. But I All think right. they're up to it. Yes. I think All so, right. too. Somebody read it. Go ahead. I'll, 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 take care, I'll take care of reading it. Okay, good. So this is John chapter 2. 
Yes. So the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, give you a little homily here. Um, the first thing to say is we've been talking about the zone, the commandments to find a zone in which the people of God were given to live so that they could adore and worship God as they were made to do, right? And so as you read on in the Old Testament, that zone is particularly Zion, is the temple, right? They're made for the temple. But of course, uh, being uh, corrupt human beings, they corrupt the temple itself, right? They, they forget its real purpose. And actually, the story in John 2, which takes place later in the other Gospels, is about the... the um, it's about the courtyard of the Gentiles, right? They have corrupted because, again, let's go back to the artery of creation and the artery of redemption. The, the story of the Bible is a story of redemption for the people of Israel and for the church for the sake of the summoning of the world back to God, right? So the place they've corrupted is the place of the Gentiles, right? The temple is where the Jews pray, but on behalf of the Gentiles, right? And the, they're witnessing to the whole world. Therefore, the creation part of the story, new creation and redemption come together in the New Testament because now it's the summons of all the peoples of the earth to be God's chosen. The zone of sanctity for the people of God now includes the summons to every family, language, people, and nation, says Revelation, right? So what's supposed to be purified here is the is the the church of all the people of God. That's the 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 evangelistic summons of the of the New Testament. And he's going to play. I mean, that you see that in like Isaiah 2, right? That all the and the latter days, all the nations of the earth will flow into Zion. Right. And he's reproving the people of God because they're impeding the invitation of all the Gentiles into this zone of of covenant with God. And finally, he says that this temple to which they're being invited is what? Right? Is his crucified and risen body, right? So the the, the temple where all the nations of the earth are now to dwell in covenant love and rest, the Sabbath rest with God is found in the actual body of Jesus Uh, crucified, risen, ascended, into which you and I are invited in the life of the church. So um, all of this, the, the, um, so this really does take us to the vision at the end of Revelation, right? That now all the world, insofar as Christ indwells it, is the temple of God to which all the nations are now invited. And this relationship of exclusive love and intimacy is now open to all the peoples of the earth because the new Zion is, is his risen body. This was, I, this was a lot of fun and very lively. It is. You know, whenever it you is. teach one of these things, what is your fear as a teacher? People won't say anything. They said a whole bunch of great stuff. So that was great. I'm grateful for that. And, um, and uh, we, uh, I pray for a, a blessed uh, less rest of Lent and Holy Week and Easter tide for you all. The Lord be with you.
and also with you. you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks that by the initiative of your grace, you call us into a, a relation of, of um, a gracious intimacy with you through Jesus Christ. And we pray that you give us, by your grace, a way of holiness to walk, which your, which your commandments show us. And uh, we pray that you would grant us in all of our striving uh, your rest. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Bishop Summer, thank you very much. That for this. was a this lot of fun. Fantastic. Thank you. Yes, and thank you. see you soon. Uh, see you once soon. again, thank you for joining St. Christopher's on this. And if uh, again, please be sure to subscribe to our channel and get notified every time we have one of these things. We look forward to seeing you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye all. Bye.